Hello, YouTube listeners. You are all very special because you have the ability to like episodes right here and now. So please hit that thumbs up before you close the tab and get to your creative work. It helps out so much for the YouTube algorithm, especially as I'm starting out. So thank you very much for doing that up front. And don't forget that you can always subscribe on your favorite podcast app to listen on your phone when you're on the go. Thanks for listening to this episode, and I'll see you face-to-face on Wednesday right here on YouTube for my shorter, bite-sized dose of inspiration. Enjoy the show and create something amazing. Your Creative Push, episode 347. There's no police that's going to come knocking at your door. This is your decision. This is your creative pursuit. Do whatever you want to do. Welcome to Your Creative Push, the podcast that pushes you to pursue your creative passions. I'm your host, Young Min Brown, and my guest today is Jamila Kanoff. Jamila is an independent artist and schoolism instructor based in Leipzig, Germany. She creates illustrations that evoke a sense of wonder and nostalgia, and she believes that art is a unique accumulation of experiences, beliefs, and aesthetics. And Jamila comes on the show today to talk about her artistic journey and how she was given the feeling that her art was not, quote, proper, and how that made her stop drawing for a very long period of time. Jamila takes us back to the moment where she discovered the way that she could sell her own work and how she found a balance when she first became a professional artist. She shares her advice for people who are considering selling their own work online and her mentality of using a pay-what-you-want policy on Patreon. She also gives us her take on Instagram, how she curates her Instagram feed, and why you should share the learning process on your own feed, especially when you're just starting out, and also why you might want to share your work on Twitter. Jamila also takes us into her creative process and the way that she starts out her drawings through writing, where she finds her inspiration, and how she curates that collection of inspiration. And finally, Jamila takes us into what a typical day and week looks like for her, giving us an actual breakdown of her current week, how she uses timers for their accountability, and knowing when to stop working for the day. Jamila is such a talented artist. She has such a cool style, and she was so kind and generous with her time and her inspiration in coming on the show that I couldn't wait to get it out to you uh, for the second episode this week, because I know you're all creating like mad men and mad women, and you need a little bit of extra inspiration. So without further ado, please sit back, relax, and enjoy my conversation with the talented Jamila Kanaf. Jamila, welcome to Your Creative Push. Thank you for having me. No, thank you so much for coming on. Um, I always, at the start of the podcast, like to give my guests the opportunity to sort of lay the groundwork and tell everybody how you got to the point you are today, creatively speaking. Uh, that's a long story. Um, it's good. Let me think. <laughs> Make it as long as you need. <laughs> <laughs> um, I never really thought I could be an artist, to be honest. Like you have a lot of people in your life telling you, oh, there's no way you can make a living doing art or, um, yeah, just like I was thinking that I'd have to do something else. And I think it's very strange that you have to decide what you want to do with the rest of your life when you're 18 <laughs> yeah. or something. So I was like, I was 18 and I figured, okay, I'm, I guess I'm good at art and I'm, good at English maybe so I enrolled in university for art and English as a teacher so I'm basically trained in education so my uh, degree is like master of education Uh, so that's what I did I moved to Leipzig from a very small town I studied education here and we had some art classes but They weren't really the kind of stuff that I do now. It was very far from it. And teachers would always tell me like, oh, this is like so anime. Like, where did you get this? Why are you doing this? So I just always kind of had the idea that what I was doing was just not proper art and wrong in a way. So I just Mm. kind of stopped drawing for a long time in school and throughout college as well for a period of time. But Eventually, on the internet, I discovered that there were people making a living doing this. Uh, They were illustrators for like trading card games and book covers and whatnot. So I figured, 
okay, there has to be a way to do this. So I worked really hard, uh, worked on my skills, got my portfolio together, sent it out to companies, got some freelance jobs. And uh, while I was still in college, like finishing up my degree, I already got some jobs. And then once I was done, I was faced with a decision of whether I wanted to pursue teaching and go to school, like do one practical year to really complete my education and then keep going with that. Or if I wanted to give it a shot and try and see if I could make a living doing art. And that's pretty much how I got there. But then now things are different as well. I do different stuff, but I, I'm sure we're going get, to yeah. get into all of that. Well, that, that's a good, a good uh, like pause point because um, you mentioned two kind of big things that I think a lot of people have had, myself included, and that's like uh, one of them is a big gap, like having like a period where you not necessarily give up, but you just maybe sort of put it on pause and just keep this, uh, this far off idea in the back of your head that uh, maybe one day, maybe one day I'll be able to create the thing that my teachers say I'm supposed to create or, or enjoy uh, creating that. So what was during that gap, what was like the kind of inciting incident or series of incidents maybe that gave you that kind of burst of inspiration to decide to go for it? I think it was really just discovering this online community of artists on Deviant Art specifically and concept art and all those old forums that were around. So yeah, as I said, I, I just always had drawn for myself, but my teachers would always tell me that this stuff is not what they want to see. So um, it was so nice for me to finally discover people out there who were doing the stuff that I was doing, who were like, I don't know, painting girls with pointy ears and mm -hmm. like other fantasy stuff. So I was like, oh my God, there's a place for me, I guess, or at least it's close to what I like. So um, I wanted to become a part of that and really fit in there because I've never had a place for me and my art until that point. Yeah, and that's why community is so ridiculously important and, and also the internet because uh, up until that point, aside from your classmates, it's like the only kind of authority figure that there is is your teachers. And I was just actually... Um, talking about this on the podcast teachers are just peers <laughs> like they're just <laughs> other people with like their yeah. own life experiences and their own real just just opinions yeah. so like when you're able to find that kind of validation online that oh my god here's my people <laughs> yeah. there are people doing this and whether it's for money or just for um just the pure joy of, of creating those those worlds it's like so liberating yeah definitely and now that i teach myself I really put a lot of focus on letting people be who they want to be and really like hey find your voice try to do stuff that's fun for you and don't try to narrow things down and push them into a corner that they don't want to be in so that's really important for me because I learned it the hard way that this right. is like really damaging Right. And what, was it difficult? Like, even though you found that community, was it difficult to almost like shed that skin, quiet those voices of, of the teachers of the past, like telling you, oh, maybe this isn't right? Or was it once you found it, it was, okay, I can create li literally whatever I want? <laughs> <laughs> it was difficult because uh, once I had found that, I kind of replaced that outside expectation with some other outside expectation that wasn't completely me. So my, my biggest struggle then was to kind of fit into that style that I thought was going to get me work. So if you've seen like uh, illustrations for Magic the Gathering, that sure. was the sort of style that I wanted to do. Now, when you look at my work, it's very different from that. And I think more like today, it's more of what I actually enjoy and what is, is actually natural to me. But back then, I... Uh, figured okay I guess this is who I am now there are these people and I want to be part of them so I kind of have to get there but it was always a little bit frustrating it was tough because the style didn't come naturally to me I had to practice so much and eventually I got good enough to get hired but in hindsight I think I was just getting this idea 
still that I can't a hundred percent be myself. And that was like my biggest hurdle in my artistic journey overall. And it was so hard to get over that. And just now I realize what I've been doing that I can been kind of sabotaging myself and putting these expectations on me where there would have probably been a way to straight like delve into the stuff that I enjoyed, which is more a bit on the anime inspired side. Well, yeah, definitely. When I first saw your work, I was like, oh, she creates movies. She creates anime. And like, these are just screenshots from her. (laughs) Like, so like, that's why your art is, it's so unique and so um, just beautiful. Thank Um, you. Oh, absolutely. But so would you say that like, at this point, you've kind of found the groove, like you found exactly what is Jamila? Right now? Yeah. Yeah, I'd say so. Yeah, it can definitely change. But I'm so comfortable with my workflow. I'm very comfortable with the kinds of things that I'm painting. I keep like exploring different things. I want to get better at environments. And just there's so much stuff and I really, really enjoy it. And I think it looks like me now. So I'm really happy that I've arrived at this point. congratulations (laughs) congratulations Thank you. <laughs> yeah because that's like that's just such like a happy mindset or like a happy thing to find because it is you know like when people are growing up uh, they they have influences and they have inspirations and they have um, this kind of um, grab bag of, of all the different things that inspire them and like the whole point of making art I think is combining those things along with your own life experience and um, it's it's difficult. Like it's like a like a scale almost. Like where you go maybe too far uh, in the direction yeah. of like somebody that you love, and you're creating like a little bit too much like them. But it's important to do that so you can kind of get that skill set and also see maybe what you don't like and see that you need to tip the scale the other way. So it's oh, like yeah. this like constant uh, battle of this like balance, <laughs> yeah. and to be able to like kind of finally hone in, I think is one of the most inspiring things to hear and to see. Yeah, but it was definitely a process. Like I went through so much sketching, uh, writing things down. I saw this talk by that one artist. I don't remember his name, but he was talking about his influences and why he paints the stuff that he paints. And he was talking about uh, like ghost stories that he would tell uh, on his grandmother's like attic. And it was just, I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I guess a lot of stuff from my early childhood is really important and is finding its way back into my work. So I was just like doing a lot of soul searching, also looking at artists that I discovered and that I liked. I think a big thing for me was uh, finding Ian McKaig's work because mm. he's drawing. And up until that point, I thought you had to be painting. You had to be painterly to make art that is impressive and that is good and that people would appreciate but once I saw his pencil drawings that were so full of life but kind of loose still I was like oh I guess you're allowed to do line work and I'm allowed to like keep my sketchier lines or just lines in general whereas before that I always felt the need to get rid of them because it wasn't proper art or whatever like all these crazy ideas right yeah all these like assumed things that are quote proper or like the way to do things or the way to um, put things out on the internet or to your audience. And I, I listened to, I forget where it was, but you, you talking about, um, I don't know if you still do it, but like watering down acrylics um, so Mm. that they're more like watercolor. Yeah. Simple things like that. Like where at like, Oh, that's so like dangerous. <laughs> like that's so like against the rules. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I think that would hold a lot of people back. Like you get your art materials and um, it's like, that's the way they're supposed to be used. It's like, how could I possibly manipulate this? You know what I mean? But it's so yeah. important to get past that and literally do whatever you want. Like it's l- anything you want to do, <laughs> you can yeah. do. Really? Like my, my main thing now is like, I think there is no art police. Like nobody's going to knock on your Mm. door and say you're using those acrylics wrong (laughs) so weird it's like the um like the tag on your mattress like that it says it's like illegal to take your take off your mattress (laughs) what like you ever see that (laughs) yeah mattress mattresses have like tags on them look on your mattress and like there's a tag and it says 
it's like under penalty of something like you're not supposed to take that tag off it's the weirdest thing <laughs> but like if you take it off like is there a mattress police <laughs> like <laughs> it's the same thing i think maybe it's a poor maybe it's a poor example but, uh, let's move I on i never knew that <laughs> now i'm curious to see what happens check it out yeah i also wanted to talk about just going back real quick that the like when you made that decision to just go for it um and you said you were still in school and you had i think a part-time job at that point um how did you kind of find that balance especially when you were just starting out and um obviously still needing to learn and develop your skills and stuff like that um how did you find that balance then oh god there was no balance, no balance. <laughs> it was hard <laughs> i was just working 24 7 so yeah it was really really hard i almost burned out back then uh, looking back i would advise myself to wait a little longer maybe take like another job like a non-art job on the side and really work on my skills and try to wait for those jobs that pay me well because the jobs i took in the beginning were like I don't know, 100 euros for an illustration that took me a couple of days. And I would just like mm. take as many of those as I could. And I would just keep working, working, working to barely make rent and afford some food. And um, that went on for like a year until I needed to change something. I was like, I cannot go on like this. This is just too much. I've been always watching this uh, one podcast uh, called one fantastic week yeah they talk a lot yeah they're great they talk a lot about yeah. like business advice like making a living off of art interview a lot of artists who do all sorts of things like not just freelance work but selling things at conventions and online and just like being an independent artist without any clients so i was so inspired by that and i just figured okay i'm gonna give this a go I have an illustration here that I've done for someone. I sent them the original and uh, I made prints of it and I put it up online. It happened to be fan art. It happened to be a Princess Mononoke drawing. I don't I don't sell fan art anymore for like legal and <laughs> pride reasons. Sure, um, yeah. But back then I did and it went so well. I sold like these prints and people actually bought them and I was so happy. I was like, okay, this is working. This was giving me more of an income than all those jobs did that were so hard for me to do. So yeah, that was my new direction. I just focused on creating little original paintings from then on. Then I added some merchandise to that. Then I applied to conventions. Now I'm selling there. So just like building some different uh, building blocks for my business to uh, give me some sort of financial security. Right. So like that first print, that was like sort of your test, I yeah. guess, like your, yeah. Uh, would you have any advice for somebody who may be at that point um, or maybe close to that point who's thinking about doing something like that, like not taking on hundred dollar commissions that take a week. Um, maybe they're in that same spot where it's like they're feeling burnout by um, doing art for other people. Would you have any advice for them then to take that first step? Anything that maybe you didn't think about or anything that you uh, did think about that went swimmingly well? <laughs> <laughs> um, to make it limited edition, I think is a good idea when you sell it online, because that kind of just prompts people to buy it then before it's gone. Um that's one thing that helped me. Other than that, I just had like a social media following at that point. I think I had 20,000 followers on Instagram. So the main thing if you want to sell things to people is just to have a lot of people see your work. There's no way around that. You have to have an audience somehow. And if you don't have that audience online, I think going to conventions is a really, really good thing. Like uh, there are lots of comic cons for me. It's like manga conventions that are pretty much my audience. And you don't need to build that audience first because the audience is there. You're just like setting your, yourself up with like, your table and your prints and make it look nice. And then all the visitors come by. So you don't need to take 
months or years to build that online following first. Right. Well, okay. And for the, for the limited print thing, then what do you say about somebody like me who was on your store the other night and I wanted to buy a, a silent walk, but it's sold out. <laughs> yeah. So what do you, what about for like later fans then who, who might be angry and cross with you? Yeah, that's a shame. I don't know. I want to. <laughs> Should have been there. <laughs> Should have been there. Yeah, I know. Now I just like uh, offer my prints for a limited time because otherwise I just have so much stock. I can never know right. how many people want to buy that because for some prints where I was really confident that people would love them, I didn't sell that many. And for other prints where I thought, oh, okay, I think maybe nobody wants this and it was just sold out so instead of making up a number before i just let it be there for like a week and then in that time frame people can buy it and after that it's gone it's like creating demand in a way so you my audience knows to really pay attention to when stuff is on sale and they have to act it's a shame for people who come later maybe i'll open like a special sale at some point but Really, I want you to get a little bit stressed of like, oh, I have to get this now, and then it's gone. <laughs> and, and one more reason to join the mailing list then. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, there is there is definitely something to be said about scarcity, and uh, that's something I really believe in the like the world of abundance, like where and you can get anything you want on the internet, and it exists forever. Like there is something to be said about creating scarcity for yourself. Yeah. This will expire, you know, this, this offer or whatever will expire in a month or like this thing won't be available ever again, unless you get it now. It kind of does bring people into action and, and, and taking action and, and purchasing. So it's smart. I'm not mad <laughs> I'm at you. I'm sorry though. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, so is there anything else that you would say about, like, because I know in the early days you were doing like store envy and kind of like letting that process be aut automated. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything that you'd say about making that transition and um, advice that you'd give to anybody that, you know, has a store envy or, or something like that where it's like completely out of your hands and it's much easier, but you're also not making as much money? I think like store envy is not a print on demand thing. Oh, it isn't? No, it's just like... Oh, my apologies. No worries. I, I was on Society6 and Inprint for a while, though. So that's just a lot of, like, nice extra pocket money, maybe. But if you really want to make this your business and something that is more sustainable, I would definitely recommend you look into opening your own shop. That gives you the option to make the prints limited, for example. You can uh, sign them. You can embellish them if you want. It's definitely easier to go with something like in print, but it's also just something that doesn't really give you that much income as well. So for my store, I did a lot of research. I just, it was overwhelming in the beginning, but then some evening I was like, I'm just going to sit down and figure this out. These are the things that I have to take into consideration so I researched uh, how to ship things like packaging prints so that they wouldn't get damaged where to buy the materials how much materials were um, how much shipping fees were internationally and nationally if I could like print the stamps at home or if I had to like go to the post office and do it there yeah what kind of shop platform I wanted so I chose store envy it's just like a normal uh, shop platform for people and it's free to sign up. And that's what I liked about it. I was also thinking about doing Etsy, but uh, for Etsy, you have to pay for each each listing, I think, even though you might not sell anything. So mm. I was just thinking, okay, what if I don't sell anything that I'm paying? So I'll just go with Store Envy and it worked well. But then at a certain point, I figured I wanted to integrate my shop into my website. I had already had the website uh, on Squarespace and they have a shop option. So I just moved it there. I think the main reason was because I couldn't set my price to euros on Store Envy and I could set my price to euros on Squarespace. So that was that transition. And yeah, after a while, it just got 
a lot, just like shipping and packaging and all this sort of stuff. It was taking up a lot of my time. So I hired my boyfriend as my assistant and now he's packaging my stuff and shipping. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, talk about a trusted <laughs> worker, you know? <laughs> yes, right? I was like, I, I cannot trust anybody with like my... Yeah account information and everything but that's the setup is perfect so far yeah one of the things you mentioned was like just doing it in one night and i think one of the things that holds people back from uh, aside from having the sort of quote ego maybe that it takes to sell art which is if you think about it kind of ridiculous because (laughs) like that's what artists do they sell art Um, yeah but but i think that's one of the holdups but the other holdup is just like the 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 actual like figuring stuff out like figuring Mm -hmm. out like you don't know how to create a store and it's just like you know it's going to take some time but it's not even that much brain power there's like so many tutorials and you can get things set up so quickly i'm guilty of this too like it took me four years to set up my mailing list (laughs) like i just did that that took me like 30 minutes to figure out yeah it wasn't hard (laughs) so like i can definitely relate when you have an idea or like you get that kind of i need to do this like uh, it's been too long i need to start selling my work or figuring out how to sell it like i have all this artwork sitting around my house like I need to either throw it out or sell it. Like yeah. that's the time to like just take that night or take that weekend just to figure that stuff out. And sometimes it's kind of actually fun. Like when you start putting yeah. in the, the work and it like starts coming together and you see that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Like, oh, okay, like this can work. Like I can figure this out. It's just sitting down and doing it. Yeah, just like pushing it off and off and off. It's just almost torturing yourself because it just keeps getting worse and you're building this up in your head as like a big task that you'll never get to and just like for me it's always been like I, I'm just going to tackle this now no questions asked I'm not talking myself out of it I'm just going to go for it and that's been working definitely well the, the another source of uh, revenue for you um, is patreon and I have a patreon yeah. as well and you did something with yours that I think I'm definitely going to do um, and that's pay what you want. Could you talk about the mentality of that? Yeah, um, I stole this from a creator I followed. She was doing this and I was like, oh, this is a pretty good idea. I like this. The main reason was just that I had a lot of work that I needed to put into the Patreon and I wanted to cut that down because with all these different tiers, I was noticing that I was putting tasks for myself in there that I wouldn't have necessarily done otherwise. I was just like, oh, I have a Patreon now. I guess I'm going to start creating time-lapse videos for people, although I don't really want to. It's just like I have to offer this because everybody does. And that was getting a little bit frustrating. I just wanted to find a way to simplify this, and I wanted to find a way that lets people be happy with what they're pledging so that they have the choice so they can't be mad at me for like not offering enough if they've decided what amount they want to give Mm. and it's also from my own uh, attitude towards patreon the creators i support i don't support them for the rewards i just want to give them like a couple of bucks to say hey i really like your work i want you to continue to do this i don't even look at the rewards or the posts that they make necessarily yeah i just follow them on other platforms and that's fine so yeah i wanted to give people the same chance for me so i figured i have a pretty large social media following and if every 10th person of that would give me like one dollar that would be amazing so that was like my thought process no that's really smart and it's so so funny because that's completely what i do anybody i support I just, if they write a blog post or whatever, I'll, I'll read it. Um, but other than that, I'm supporting to support. And I don't know yeah. why I didn't think that that would translate to um, your creative pushes Patreon um, because for it's been up for like three years and I've changed my tiers f- like three different times and not one person has cashed in on any of the, <laughs> the bonuses. And I have oh, some really? patrons like, but yeah. So I was like, okay, they're just supporting just to support. So yeah. what was the... When you switched, I, I assume you already had some patrons and then mm-hmm. you switched to the pay as you want, just so I know, like, how did that work administratively? Like, did they all have to like re-opt in and choose an amount or did it kind of just 
like uh, whatever their tier was, it just went over. Yeah, I think you can unpublish the tier mm. and people stay in that or they get thrown out and they don't have a tier at all anymore. I, I don't remember, but for me, okay. it didn't make a difference because I am just sending my reports out via message every single month to everyone. So I mm -hmm. didn't worry about that too much, but I just got a message recently talking about this thing, like changing your tiers and all that. Uh, and they said, if you unpublish it, it's going to stay the same for the people that have already signed up. And then you can introduce a new tier that new people can sign up to. Mm. So okay. yeah, I definitely want to keep the pay what you want structure, but I am going to change it to a minimum of two euros, uh, $2 now, just because of the conversion rate from uh, a yeah. dollar to euro. It's always like, yeah, it's not, it's not one euro. It's less. Yeah. I was talking to my patrons about it and they were really, really positive. And so they're gonna remain the same. I'm gonna do that, unpublish the tier. So my one euro, no, one dollar patrons can stay there. And I'm just gonna start the pay what you want thing at two dollars now and see how that goes. Yeah, I think for the for the one dollar tier, I haven't looked into the math of it, but apparently like that, like the one dollar is a pretty big percentage that Patreon takes as well. Yeah. So I think there's like a, a good reason to do a $2 one. And it's really not that much more if you think about it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's double, but <laughs> it would still take you like $4 to buy a cup of coffee anyway. So <laughs> 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 yeah. Anyway, so You had this video that I watched. It was, I think a couple years old, but it still applies today. And it's Instagram for artists. Oh, and well, you dug deep. <laughs> I did, yeah, but <laughs> it's a good video, and we'll link it up for the, in the show notes. There's ten great tips for people to grow on Instagram. But the one takeaway that I that I just had to mention um, with you today was um, the kind of expectations, um, and for people that are just starting out and just learning to be realistic about the fact that they're they're not just going to start publishing art. Um, they should publish their art. They shouldn't be afraid to do that. Um, but like it's not like they're going to get 100,000 followers like in the first year or anything like that to be honest about their expectations and to be honest about their experience and to talk about the fact that they're learning and i think that that gives a lot of kind of courage to upcoming artists that are working on their skills to post their work even if it's not at the place that they want it to be so that they can sort of have that discussion with their potential audience or growing audience about the learning process and kind of what they think. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk about that a bit. Yeah, I think it's really nice to just share what you're up to. If that's what art you're making or how you're struggling with it, I think that connects you to other people. And I think a, a lot of people who follow art are interested in it because they also like to pursue it themselves. So it just builds this personal connection and it also gives the impression that you're not perfect. So sharing that journey, even though you feel you're not ready, is like super important. And to be honest, you never feel completely ready. Mm -hmm. Like it's just like, oh, I'm there. I'm I'm great now. Here's my work. It's, it just doesn't happen. This right. would be super weird. So I have a lot of people who I've followed for years and years. And it's just so amazing to compare their work back then and today. And I also have a lot of people telling me, especially on DeviantArt, hey, I've followed your work for so long and it's so great to see how far you've come and how you've changed. So I think this is just such a nice journey that you can have together with people. And it, it takes years. Yeah, there are some like overnight successes that you see, but those people aren't really overnight successes because you don't see the hard work they put in before they started posting. So just everybody goes through the same steps and some people decide to share it, some people decide not to, but there's always a good motivation for like starting early to put stuff out there because who knows what's going to happen in a couple of years. It could get a head start and it could build community. Right. And I'm sure those quote overnight successes are regretting not posting earlier too. Yeah, I like, bet. They're like, oh, wow, look at this. Like, I, why haven't I been doing this all along? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And also like, I, it's, yeah, sometimes you see these accounts, they pop up out of nowhere and they have like 15 posts and so many followers and every single painting is great. 
and you get this idea that they were just born like that but that's absolutely not true so i prefer right. those people who are really open and honest about their struggles and process and learning experience well, well speaking of process you post process shots as well um, could you talk about what you decide goes into your feed and maybe what goes somewhere else yeah i've been revamping that recently because instagram is always bugging me with its algorithm and i'm mm -hmm. trying to adjust mm -hmm. so usually i would just post up anything that i was kind of proud of so let's say i did a, a sketch for a new painting and it was black and white but i was like yeah this is the sketch now this is what i did today here it is and um it's it was just always a thing for me to share my day's work not have it go into like a void but being able to connect with people and kind of talk about my day and what i've done but now i yeah reserve these things for stories more than anything else on twitter i can post whatever i want twitter doesn't care but for instagram i try to keep my feed a little bit more neat and have colored work in there and uh finished work and some close-ups and the rest will go into my stories because the algorithm won't let me just post anything without acting weird. It's a shame. <laughs> I would love to uh, share more. And that's also why I prefer Twitter as a social network because it's just like more loose, more communicative, feels like more of a community. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's something I was going to ask you because I, I do feel like <laughs> Facebook totally screwed up Instagram when it got its mm -hmm. grubby hands on it. Yes. Um, but I think a lot of people are used to, or a lot of visual artists are used to Instagram. That's just like kind of what's normal to them, regardless of where the platform goes. Could you talk about Twitter? Because I know that you have a like a much better, even though you have less followers on there, you have a b better like conversion rate. Like people click on your mm -hmm. links more. Yeah. And like you said, they interact uh, very openly with you. So could you maybe give some inspiration to people to uh, that are kind of stuck on the Instagram train uh, to jump over to uh, or in addition to uh, jump onto Twitter? Yeah, come to Twitter, people. It's nice. <laughs> <laughs> There's like a lot come of... Come on over. The water's yeah. fine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> jump on it. Um, no, there's like a really, really nice art community. And once you see that and follow some people they share other people's work and you're like oh there's this person there's this person this is so cool and i also love that the site works through sharing basically so once you post some art and another artist retweets it their followers are going to see it and that's how it works rather than on instagram through the weird mysterious algorithm and hashtags and all the stuff that's happening that nobody really understands <laughs> yeah. so on twitter it just feels like everybody's really supportive of each other there are these uh hashtags happening there are hashtags too but they work a little differently um there's one called visible women where just like female illustrators tag their work uh just like talk about who they are and add that hashtag and then for one day like all kinds of people share it and it's just so nice to have your feed flooded with new artists that you're discovering uh, people are really open about stuff like they don't just talk about their art but also other issues that concern them some people like that some people don't I personally like knowing a little bit more about the artist behind the work and Twitter just makes it easier to do that like I, I don't know I don't like it if people tweet every five minutes what they're doing right now that's a little too much for me but just like getting that little extra peek behind the scenes and getting a sense of who that person is and them having an easy time interacting with you and you responding back I think this is just yeah it just feels more like a community I really like it yeah, it feels less. I'm on Twitter, and it's funny because you get into different echo chambers too. Like, uh, there's like uh, I was into cryptocurrency for a while. Like, so there's the crypto, and then there's like the sports Twitter. It's like there's yeah. different like sub genre, almost like subreddit reddits. Yeah, but it's like you can you can really curate your your feed a lot easier, and you can get to actually see 
<laughs> the people that you follow, that you've chosen to follow, you can actually see what they're putting out as opposed to having to, like in your feed, as opposed to having to seek them out, uh, where it feels like Instagram, every time I log on, it's like the same few people are at the top of my feed every time. And I have to really scroll deep to find, yeah. you know, some of the maybe lesser known, like some of the, you know, fans of the podcast, some of the people that are just starting out, like I have to like actively search for them. So it's in that respect, if that's happening to me, that's super demoralizing for artists that are just starting out, like oh, when yeah. they can't get any traction. And it's like trying to figure out this algorithm like uh I, I feel like algorithm is the word algorithm just sends like chills down people's backs like <laughs> yeah. having to figure this thing out it's like why can't we just leave algorithms alone <laughs> yeah yeah there was this hot minute where uh the weird network popped up was it vero vero uh do you remember that no no there was like some social platform uh, that claimed to have no algorithm and chronological order and they said the mm. first million users can sign up for free so everybody signed up for like a day or two and then it died down <laughs> yeah it was it was crazy like everybody was on there and then they weren't <laughs> and then so they like were. people really craving that old structure unfortunately i think it's gone forever yeah yeah rest in peace <laughs> mm. I wanted to talk about how you get ideas or like maybe where do you find inspiration from? Mm, pretty much a combination of media I watched and consumed when I was a child, experiences from my early childhood and uh, pictures I find on Pinterest today. And to go into that a little bit more, I mentioned earlier that I heard this artist talk about the experiences like at his grandmother's attic and I remembered that I spent so much time in my grandparents' garden when I was a kid. So I don't know how old I was. It was just a lot of summers in a row. We would just go to this like little garden and it was surrounded by fields and a forest and there was a canal and I would just like run through the forest and... I don't know, play with grasshoppers and collect branches and make like bows and arrows and uh, fishing poles and just like play like kids do. So oh, I feel so happy right now imagining yeah, that. <laughs> that was so nice. That was one of the, the best times I remember. And I totally forgot that. But mm. a lot of like nature stuff crept into my work. So uh, when I tried to identify where that was coming from. This was like an aha moment when I realized, oh, this is it. So I also really loved anime growing up. I still like absolutely love Studio Ghibli movies, uh, especially like the background paintings. And I think those two things kind of connect because uh, when I was a kid, everything was kind of magical and seemed I don't know, more saturated or more beautiful than it actually was. So I think the way those backgrounds are painted in the Studio Ghibli movies captures that feeling of how I would see the world when I was a child. So I try to recapture that as well now in my own work. And I think that's how they blend together. And I just love browsing images i just um, am on pinterest all the time and i'm like oh this is a cool city or like look at this village somewhere in the mountains i want to draw something like that one day so i just have this huge huge list of things that i still want to paint and since i started getting into environments and landscapes a bit more it feels like the whole world opened up to me and i just want to paint all these places and i want to travel and take photos and paint what I've seen it's pretty much the dream for me so I'm really excited about that amazing yeah and it makes sense now that it all it kind of all makes sense <laughs> that your backgrounds <laughs> are so amazing and I think when somebody else might get that maybe have that aha moment like oh, I remember like when I was a kid, I loved going out in nature and, and making bows and arrows and hanging out with grasshoppers. Like, <laughs> um, maybe I should incorporate that, but uh, it would just take too long. <laughs> you know, <laughs> what advice might you give them when they get that idea 
um, that they need to maybe make their backgrounds more detailed um, or, you know, fill in the blank, something that might be much more time consuming and as a result, create less output? I don't know, actually. I I think they're not me. They don't have to paint these like super detailed backgrounds. I think they have their own version of how they can represent their own past and their influences. So that might not even be for painting. Maybe it's photography. That's definitely quicker than rendering Mm -hmm. something for 40 (laughs) hours. Or like maybe they have a simpler style that still captures that kind of wonder and nostalgia. So yeah, I just happen to be really influenced by these detailed backgrounds some other person might be more influenced by other like cartoons that they watched that were more simplified or like something completely different, just like really figure out what it is that you want to say with your work, how much work you want to put in, like what process you enjoy. This is also the thing I really, really enjoy painting details. I wouldn't do it if I wasn't enjoying myself. So yeah, find a process for you that is fun And that gives you something that you can say is really like a representation of yourself. That sounds so hard and it kind of is, but (laughs) once you're at that point where you're like, oh, I think think I found it, it's really, really satisfying. So yeah, I hope you get there. (laughs) Right, and it takes time. Now, when you're talking about, you know, finding inspiration on Pinterest and stuff like that, and I know that you save a lot of, images and stuff on your computer for reference. Could you talk about the importance of sort of curating or cultivating like a, uh, a collection of uh, references or inspiration? Yeah. Um, again, I am <laughs> a special case. Maybe other <laughs> people are not me. I am just like so obsessed with collecting images. I absolutely love it. I have like a huge, huge library and it's super organized. I have a folder of I don't know, one is called characters and then there's like female characters, male characters. And then those split into folders of like young, middle, older and stuff like that. So it's just like, I have this collection so that I can find stuff easily. And for me, that's really important because when I'm planning a new illustration, my mind immediately goes like, oh, I have this face somewhere that would be perfect for this I have this expression saved up somewhere so I can use that and if I were to go out and just like start a search from zero it would be harder I think you would just like go into google and type in like I don't know surprised kid and then you would get something that is maybe not what you're looking for so Mm -hmm. for me it's really important to just kind of have this library that I can draw from. I have like color palettes saved. I have movie stills and oftentimes it just an image comes together in my mind when I have a vague idea. I don't know. Let's say kid is making like bow and arrow in the forest. Then I would just like start browsing my libraries, seeing what kind of maybe clothes I want for the kid or what kind of forest it's supposed to be, what kind of color palette, what kind of time of day, mood, all those sorts of things that come together when I see these images. And I'm a very, very visual person. I need to see stuff to imagine it. And the value of having that kind of database at your fingertips is then whenever you aren't necessarily feeling inspired or you're in a sort of block or funk you have this thing that previously inspired you hopefully Mm -hmm. they're images that have inspired you um that you know okay past jamila like this so (laughs) let's (laughs) let's kind of get the brain working as opposed to like you know going to google images or going to pinterest and just not even knowing what to type in yeah uh, to, to search so it's like so good to have that sort of backup yeah definitely and pinterest gets smarter the more you feed it it knows what i like and it shows me what i like <laughs> that sounds scary <laughs> yes but also good <laughs> yeah that's good i know that when you you have an interesting way of um, starting a project too with writing yeah could you talk about that because i obviously as a writer i'm i'm right on board with you <laughs> but for visual artists that might not think of starting this way um, i think it's a pretty valuable tip yeah i just kind of think 
it is easier to form an idea before you start to visualize it or before you start to draw it. So the way I see it, if I, yeah, going back to the example I told you, I want to draw a kid making like a bow and arrow in the forest. So when I start going into that now, I things are not really clear for me right now. I don't know what camera angle I want from it. Like, where is the viewer? Uh, what kind of pose is it exactly? Uh, what's the environment like? What does it look like? Um, there's just so much information that I want to gather first. So I do like little word association exercises. Yeah, so I might just start out with this simple sentence. Kid makes bow and arrow in the forest. And I just like branch out different arrows just saying like maybe it's a forest of pine trees maybe it's sunset maybe the kid is wearing like uh some outfit that they made of leaves or something just like developing the idea before I'm ready to put it onto paper or put it into photoshop that's really important for me before it starts slipping away because I feel like when it's not fleshed out yet As soon as I start drawing, it kind of disappears for me or it gets replaced with something that mm. I didn't necessarily want in the beginning. So, yeah, just like for me, a lot of prep work helps me out. And again, everybody's different. I know a lot of artists who are a lot more spontaneous than me. This is just what's been working well for me. And I like to stick to that. Right. And then if like your plan changes as you're <laughs> drawing, I imagine like for, for writing for me, it's like really easy. Well, actually it's <laughs> not always easy, but it's easy to just like select a whole bunch of text and hit delete and start over. Yeah. But like, it also takes me a lot less time to write that scene or whatever it is, than it would take somebody to draw that scene. And so like, once you have that, you feel like you're kind of committed to it. Yeah. Um, is that the case? Yeah, definitely. Words are like quicker to redo than whole drawings, definitely. And I did this exercise uh, at a talk that I gave at a convention last year, just like creating little stories together with people saying like, give me a location, give me a character, give me an action. What are they doing? What time of day is it? What's the mood like? What's the color palette? And we came up with like really fun stories and they were surprised how easy it is to come up with something because when you start at another point and you're just like, oh, I guess I want to draw a character or like you start drawing a random character and you don't know what you can do with them. That's like so right. weird for me. That's starting backwards. So I like to think about it first and then, uh, then start. Definitely. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> And before we get to the end here, um, I also was wondering what your typical day might look like. Um, how much are you planning? How much are you actually drawing and painting? How much are you uh, doing kind of admin stuff? <laughs> what does your day look like? Um, I could show you a detailed breakdown. Uh, I, I use Toggle to track all my work hours for every single thing that I do. So I Let me, let me check what I did this week. Uh, this is great for a podcast. No, that's great. <laughs> I'm sure that uh, your hour with me is highlighted and starred as the number one priority. Of course. Of <laughs> I wasn't sure where to put that because I have like different projects set up. One is social media, one is like admin. I was like, I have nothing for a podcast. I'd say like charity work, helping out. Oh, no. You're doing charity work for me. No. <laughs> This week. Okay, I did 33 hours. And from that was 20 hours illustration, two hours admin work, one hour convention prep, two hours Patreon, a little bit of research, two and a half hours of schoolism, critiques, four hours of social media roughly so um yeah this is a good ratio i see that illustration has been the biggest part which is what i aim for always so i make sure to at least paint four hours every day like not every day mm. but from monday to friday i take the weekends off um, two days just, off yeah nice just because i found that uh my attention span 
is four hours long for painting and then I start to feel weird and my head gets mushy and I'm like, oh, I need to stop. So that's what I aim for. And then I just do other tasks on top of that, whatever is necessary. Uh, I found that I do well when I get small tasks out of the way in the morning. So if I have like five items on my to-do list and three of them are like order new packaging material, sign up for this convention and answer email to someone, I can just do those in like a couple of minutes. And then I have already three items checked off and I feel accomplished and really good mm -hmm. so that I can start drawing. Uh, a typical day for me is I get up around eight to nine, maybe, and I have some breakfast, watch some YouTube videos get ready and then I'm at my desk between 10 and 11 and then I will uh, work for like around two hours and I'll eat again because then I'll be hungry again I'm always very hungry in the morning and around noon and then I'll work for another yeah around four hours mostly sometimes all of that gets pushed back like sometimes I will go grocery shopping in between or like meet a friend and then I'll sit down and work until midnight maybe but usually I work around six hours every day depending on how much I have to do and do you ever find that the the illustration hours are difficult like do you ever get blocked mm, not blocked but some some parts are harder than others I think when I'm coming up with something new, I tend to procrastinate a little bit more because that's the hard part, getting the sketch down and really having to think about it a lot. That takes a lot of mental energy and it's a little bit more draining. So I feel like those four hours can stretch very long. It feels much longer than it is. But once I'm at the stage where I have a sketch set, I start the colors And it's just all about rendering out those little details. That's when I really can zone out and have fun with it. Yeah, I'm very lucky I haven't had art block or anything in a while. It's more of the opposite. I want to do so many things and there's not enough time or I don't have enough energy for it. Yeah, but that's usually how it goes. I Yeah, the start is always the hardest for me, just like coming up with the sketch and then it gets really smooth from there. And what you're describing, I think, is a common idea. It's like the start is tough because that's where, like you said, it, it requires the most brain power, but that's also like the time period where the thing that you're creating could end in failure. And oh, like yeah. it's like once you have it sketched out or like the idea kind of there, like the skeleton or the base there, and then the rest is just kind of like stuff that you've done a lot and that you trust yourself to be able to sort of meditate as you're doing it. Would you have any advice for getting through that difficult stage? Yeah, just, <laughs> I think I just need to force myself to push through sometimes. I, push and through. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking for most of the stuff that I do, I like to put on like a nice podcast or like a Netflix series or something. And that keeps me entertained while I'm painting. But especially for that first phase, I cannot do that because it distracts me too much. So what I like recently, what I've done is uh, put on like some ambient noise. Like, for example, there are like ASMR videos of sounds from the uh, Hogwarts library or something. So you have like crackling fire in the background and rain outside. Cool. So that kind of <laughs> sets the mood. So I kind of have an easier time focusing, but it's still a little bit hard. I still have the urge to get up and get a snack every 10 minutes or check social media. It's, it's hard, but... When I'm really in the zone, like after maybe half an hour or 45 minutes, it does get easier that I'm like in the flow and I can uh, keep working on it, but it's still a little bit uncomfortable. And I think that's just never going to go away. And that's a part of just like pushing yourself to do things. And if you were to do the same thing over and over again, it would be easy, but it would also be boring. So mm. I kind of enjoy the discomfort a little bit. Yes. Uncomfortability is definitely important. I try to do something yeah. uncomfortable every day. 
so does so toggle does that is that like a running clock like when you like is it like a stopwatch almost yeah yeah does that help then when you have that like inclination to get up and go get a snack or go check instagram or go whatever does that help you like knowing that you're sort of on the clock yeah now that you mention it it does like it's really i I hit the timer it started now i really have to work otherwise i'm cheating myself or i have to hit pause again and start again so Mm -hmm. yeah i find that those hours i clock in are really focused work if i'm not doing anything i won't hit play so that's really good that's keeping me on track and that's also creating a separation between what is free time and what is work time because i know when that timer is off i don't have to do anything which (laughs) is great when you're working from home because i don't have that physical separation um but at least i do have this timer that keeps me on track and that lets me take time off sometimes and then what's the importance of stopping after you said like four hours is your time (laughs) that you're able to do kind of (laughs) deep work and i'm sure it's different for every person like what's the importance of then stopping once you hit that weird feeling like you're talking about yeah just like not burning ourselves out i don't want to go back to that point where I was years ago when I did all those freelance jobs, I was just like constantly tired, never felt any joy in what I was doing. So now sometimes I want to keep going, but I tell myself, no, this is it for today. And then I feel like I'm excited the next day. But when I keep dragging myself through the process and just like not stopping, I I'm drained the next day, or if not the next day, maybe the day after or the week after. It just, at some point you feel it, or at least I do. So I really make sure to take the weekends off, to not overwork myself, also because I don't want to risk injuring my wrist. So it's like a lot of hand injuries that artists have that work too much, too many hours. So just all of that for health reasons staying sane and keep <laughs> enjoying what you're doing really yeah self-care at the end of the day yeah and you also mentioned schoolism critiques and i was listening to you and bobby chu who's an alumni of this show talking about your course about storytelling mm-hmm. can you talk about that course real quick before we let you go yeah um it's Pretty much the stuff I've talked about, uh, about how I come up with ideas and inspirations. That's sort of the building block of it. Uh, The first part of it is just like getting people to come up with ideas. And then I walk them through my process of how to go from that vague idea to a finished illustration without overwhelming yourself. That's like the most important thing to me that I teach a workflow or offer an alternative for a workflow that is mm, that you can use to break things down mm. and get the results that you hope for hopefully and to make it easy because i've heard so many people talk about how you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that and that's too easy and that's cheating and i'm like no i'm going to show you all the stuff that i do and there's like a lot of stuff in there that's considered cheating but Uh, I just want you to have fun and I want you to enjoy it and I want you to find that process for you without feeling guilty about it. So, yeah, I'm really excited about storytelling. So that's a big part of it. It just goes into creating these little stories and filling them with life and uh, being able to manifest them in a visual format. Catching lightning. (laughs) That's what it is. And that's what the title of the course is, too. Yeah. Yeah. Jamila, thank you so much for coming on the show today, but it is time for the final push. And that's where I ask you to reach through the microphone and grab the shoulder of one of the listeners that you've really inspired today and just give them your best final words of advice and really push them to pursue their own creative passions. Okay, listen to me. (laughs) (laughs) Um, No, really, I'm just pretending the listener is me a couple of years ago, making the same dumb mistakes that I'm making. I would tell myself, really, just be yourself. Don't listen to the people who tell you that you should do something else just because it's their taste or their idea of how something is supposed to be. This is your decision. This is your creative pursuit. 
do whatever you want to do. And there is no police that's going to come knocking at your door, telling you to do things another way. Just like have fun, enjoy it, be yourself and don't let people talk you out of it. I love it. Jamila, thank you so much for coming on the show today, for giving us that push and sharing your story. I really appreciate it. Thank you. (laughs) It was fun. Yeah, it was. (laughs) Um, And for everybody listening, you can find Jamila on her website, jamilaknopf.com. That's D-J-A-M-I-L-A-K-N-O-P-F.com. We'll have everything linked up at today's show notes page, yourcreativepush.com slash 347. Jamila, thanks again. Thank you. Huge thank you once again to Jamila for coming on the show. Uh, In this outro, I want to talk about teetering, that process of teetering back and forth until you settle in on your style. And this is something that really screams through what Jamila said, uh, but also in looking at her art. It was so inspiring to hear the story that that common story that we've heard so many times before of a teacher when she was younger or an authority figure telling her that her work wasn't proper, that she needed to change her style. And it took years and years and even some breaks of her teetering back and forth to finally hone in and settle in on her style. And her style is currently on point. (laughs) So perhaps you are struggling with that teeter-totter right now of going back and forth from what you're told that you can do or can't do or what you're telling yourself you can or can't do versus what your heart, what your soul really wants to put out. It's okay to be on that teeter-totter. Everybody is on that teeter-totter. Just continue to teeter and to totter (laughs) until you hone in on what's honest to you, what's perfect for you, I promise it will be worth it. And it also should be noted that the teetering and tottering can be applied to all aspects of creativity and life. For example, scheduling, scheduling in your day. That was another teeter-totter that Jamila had, uh, working too much or too little, where her brain would turn to mush if she was working too long, so she knew she had to stop Set those timers, figure out that process. It's not going to be perfect at first, and it's going to take trial and error to go back and forth to working too much, working too little, getting anxious because you're not working enough, or getting burnt out because you're working too much. Just relax as you go back and forth. Realize that we all go through it, and you'll eventually settle in. The whole creative life is a big teeter-totter, so just relax and hang in there. One of the other things that I've been teetering and tottering on, (laughs) as I mentioned in the episode, was my Patreon. And I did decide to change my Patreon to the way Jamila does it, pay what you want. So if you want to pay what you want and get all of the benefits that are involved with Your Creative Push on Patreon, head to yourcreativepush.com slash Patreon. You get episodes a week before they air, although this one came out only a couple days because I decided to bump it forward. I'm also going to be sharing my YouTube videos on there before they air, sharing bonus content whenever I get it, and announcing upcoming guests before I interview them so that you can ask me questions to ask them that will hopefully make the conversations that much better. And on next week's episode, which is only a few days away, we have Alatar. Al came back on the show. This is the fourth installment of Alatar. I figured who better to come on this show during these crazy times than Al So we talk about the coronavirus, the quarantine, what life is like, what life might be like after. And also Al and I both share personal things that we've been going through, uh, something that I haven't mentioned to you all yet. Uh, I kind of announce on the episode in a few days and Al talks about the difficult struggles that they've been going through uh, over the past few months and how they got through them. Definitely a must listen to. Um, If you are feeling a little bit of cabin fever, perhaps, hopefully it will come as a reprieve to you if you are feeling crazy during these crazy times. But that's all I've got for you today. So hopefully you were inspired to go and get your work done. So go and get it done. Keep teetering. Keep tottering. Hang in there. I love you all so much. And remember that the universe deserves your creations and you are the universe. I love you all.